508. Here we are again, another week, another couple lectures. Um, it is July 24th. It is. <laughs> I think. Yeah, you know, that means <laughs> two more weeks. I know. So um, the good news is that you don't have another paper or midterm um, until August. But the bad news is August is coming up pretty fast on us. Right. So um, yeah, well, try let's to take a look over here what we got going on. Okay, don't we have an exam just like you guys did before? All right, but it's for the last half of the material. And you guys killed the first half, so no worries there. And then we have down here uh, the marketing pamphlet, okay, because you guys are all corporate and you're going to use this information, right? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So absolutely. hopefully that will be a little easier and a little more fun than your awesome. first paper assignment. And I will do a review, um, send out a review outline um, before the final exam. Right. And here's the pamphlet, okay? It describes everything we want to do. So this is not, this is your pitch deck, you know, so to speak. That you're going to be submitting um, to a corporation, or alternatively, you already have a corporation you're working for, and this is just how you're going to advertise your. Um, your company to all the different clients and all the great things that you can be offering. Yes. So, and when you do your pamphlet, don't stress if you're not a, com a very techy, computer savvy person. Um, we've had people in the class whose careers involved using software and making things like this. And so of course that's, that was their, their wheelhouse, that was their strength. So they did very sophisticated you know, <laughs> graphics and things like that. If that's not your thing, it's okay. Um, we're looking at content. Um, we like it if you have some cool figures and pictures and things like that. But, but I don't want you to stress out about the formatting of the um, corporate corporate marketing pamphlet. Something very visual. It's great for me. And again, you know, you think about your future clients. You know, and maybe you can use this someday professionally. You know, I'm not kidding about that. So, um, awesome. All right. So I just clicked on the weekly assignments. Okay, so I'll click on it again. And hey, we're back to where we were. And we are going into Great music. forms of intervention, music. music and exercise this Absolutely. week. And um, what you may see as we talk about interventions is that there's some overlap between interventions. So if we talk about um, yoga or exercise, it's, there's a little bit of overlap with meditation. Um, when we talk about music, there's a little bit of overlap with sociality. Um, so, and that's, that's fine and actually reinforces the fact that these, these interventions are highly effective. And so we start to see a little bit of um, how they fit together um, in terms of how people use them. So, and, but you guys are academics, you guys are scientists. And so what you try and do, you try and hone it down to a single independent variable, you know, like exercise, like diet like music, but it, like Julie said, there's there's a lot of overlap. Okay, so. and so I did update the PowerPoint, so now right it there. says Music 2022. And, I, and we already downloaded this thing, so we're going to go right into it right here, okay? Okay, and then and go, we'll go to the, to the very top. top okay. We'll, all right. So I love talking about music, and I love the impact that music has on people, and we've seen it firsthand recently with um one of our friends has a dad who is in his 90s and he was experiencing dementia. He was experiencing depression. He had lost his wife not too long ago. He was refusing to leave the house. He was um, really withdrawn. And John suggested to them, hey, why don't you guys find some music that he likes from when he was younger and play that music for him? So they were over at his house, kind of poking around. They found a big box of vinyl records. Um, which of course are really cool right now. They got a, a turntable set up. He started playing these, these old albums that he'd had for a long time. And suddenly he's alive and awake and he wants to go out to breakfast and he wants to do things and his mood has improved and his interactivity and sociality has improved. And so it was a very um, wonderful example of the power of music and music therapy that we've seen firsthand just recently. So that's kind of cool. So I'm going to see if I can advance. And uh, if you yeah. take my classroom in residence, and Julie does the same thing, you know, uh, when we take breaks, we blast music, <laughs> yes. you know, because because it has been shown, as Julie's going to talk about it, is it dramatically improves cognition because you activate all parts of the brain. And then having all those parts active, but then you try and focus in on something, you learn better. Sure. And um, music influences your memory. Um, I took a um, exercise class. Um, we, we've been married 35 years next month. And I, we were working, I think we were working at um, UCLA then. Mm -hmm. And I took an exercise class to the UCLA um, Fitness Center. 
And when I hear the Eurythmics, I want to drop down and do triceps push-ups <laughs> because I remember vividly that class. I was in really good shape because, you, you know, you're getting married. You want to be in good shape. So anyway. I'll show you some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should put the, the Eurythmics on a little bit now and do some tricep push-ups. So a lot of people listen to music when they work out. Um, and it's very meditative and it kind of distracts your body from maybe some of the pain you're experiencing as you're working your body really hard. And, um, and so that's just another just practical real life example of how your brain and your body respond to music. And you see it professionally. You know, and I, I like to watch an athletes, but, you know, I'm totally into surfing and I watch a professional surfing tour. But when you watch basketball, basketball players, basketball players, football players, they always have their um, their headsets on. And it just gets them into the right mental framework. So then when they take it off, boom, they can they're, ready there, to go. they're ready, they're to, ready to go. So from a psychological standpoint, it alleviates stress. So you're, you're pretty hyped up for your big game, but you're listening to your music and it's something familiar. It's music you love. So it, it makes you calm and, and, and happy. And then you play energetic music. So then you get psyched. And so if you have a big job interview coming up, you know, it doesn't really matter. Or, you know, you have a big exam, you know, so, so whatever, you know, professional track you're going into, and unless you go to law school and you've got to take the, um, uh, the bar exam, you know, you put on your headsets, you know, and you get yourself ready right before you go in the exam. And it's been shown to improve performance. Yes, absolutely. So I put this slide together because I wanted to just give you an example and also a link to a website that's kind of fun that you can go into this. Um, I think it's University of Central Florida website and just explore the different parts of the brain that respond to music. We have um, a, a brain scan on the upper right hand side that shows when you're listening to music, the, the reddish yellow sections of the brain that are lit up. Those are the parts of the brain that are activated. So you can see this widespread activation across all of the different brain centers. So it's not just one part of the brain that gets activated. It's numerous parts of the brain that get activated. And then that's why music is so good for your brain. Um, let's see. I want to talk a little bit, because I know it's going to come up in the quiz, about the corpus callosum. So... Um, that connects the two sides of the brain, right, John? Right. It's the information <laughs> highway. You can kind of see it right in here between the two hemispheres, all right? So sometimes we have people with brain injuries that the, the connection between the two sides of the brain gets, gets severed, and that can cause some pretty significant problems. But when you're listening to music, that corpus callosum allows the information from the music to travel back and forth and light up different parts of your brain, which is kind of fun. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, and this is another um, graphic that I found that just shows what's happening in every part of your brain. Um, we'll uh, talk a little bit about the limbic system, which is the emotional section of your brain, emotional response. And when you listen to music, quite often you might hear a song that's really sad or that reminds you of a relationship that ended or something like that. And 20 years later, you'll have tears in your eyes. Sometimes I'll listen to a song that reminds me of my mom. And although she's been gone for a couple of years, it's just like she's right there in front of me. Right. And, or, you know, a positive part of your device. Yes, okay, positive. <laughs> so so we... it allows you to reminisce, you know, and, and you, you hear a song and you're immediately back into, for example, 1987. Yes, <laughs> Anita Baker, since our wedding anniversary is coming up, we um, chose an Anita Baker song for our wedding, for our first dance. We went to an Anita Baker concert a year or two ago. She was at, mm -hmm. or was it pre-pandemic? It was pre-pandemic. It might have been yeah, pre-pandemic. Um, she was at the, the Greek Theater, the Greek theater yeah. and we were in heaven, and all the people around us were like, wow, y'all are really enjoying this concert. And we're like, yeah, it's all about our wedding, and this is our wedding song, and so the whole the whole um, group around us was really excited. So, so that's us. an interesting um, example of memory, uh, how it can trigger memory because it is so limbic, so emotional. And because emotion and memory, they're very, very strong in terms of what you uh, retrieve, good memories and bad memories. Yes. Um, good emotions, bad emotions. I laugh sometimes because when my kids were going through elementary school, sometimes they would do these little plays that had songs in them. And now my son is 26 and, and sometimes something will trigger it and he'll burst into the song from mm. his first grade play because you remember that song 20 
years later, which is really cool that, that um, and we'll see um, as we talk about people with dementia, how um, music can, can revitalize their, their memories as they listen to music from, from when they were young. But anyway, so this is kind of a cool um, figure that just talks about all these different parts of your brain that get activated by music, your auditory cortex, as you're listening to sounds and processing sounds, your visual cortex, if you're a musician and you're reading music, or you might be um, watching a video on TV or in a concert watching, you know, Bruno Mars do his dance moves or something like that, or, or your own dance moves. Um, we've got some planning, executive function um, that's important in, in music. We've got um, emotional responses to music in the limbic system and the amygdala, things like that. Um, and if you are a musician and you're singing or playing an instrument, that that brings even more um, your your motor cortex because you're moving your fingers, your prefrontal cortex because you're kind of thinking about how loud or how soft. You know, what's my planning? What am I doing? I'm thinking about this, right? Right, and okay. you know, with the amygdala, don't you know? We we've demonized the amygdala, but the, the reality is, and when you when you tap into it just right, and there are they, you know, for simplicity, we've called it just the amygdala. But there are different regions, okay? And so there are different regions that can be um, activated in a positive way than act, they can actually be beneficial to your overall behavior. When we were th thinking about the visual cortex, it's funny, I, I immediately started thinking, um, again, being uh, uh, nostalgic and reminiscing, I saw a vision. We so she's talking about vision and music. And when, remember, when we first started going out, MTV just started. And we used to watch Duran Duran. And um, remember that song, Rio? When they're sitting out on the front of the yacht going about 40, 40 knots or 40 miles an hour, whatever they were in. And it's like, you know, I immediately remembered that. So, exactly. that, so that's a visual part of, of the music, too. Yeah, yeah. so your memory and your, your visual cortex right. lights up. So that's why all the different parts of your brain light up as you are um, listening to music and, and, and it triggers a lot of responses. So how does music affect your brain? It boosts your immunity, which I think is awesome. And having looked at this since I have a compromised immune system, maybe I should be listening to music a little more All often. Um, stimulates endorphins. So we know endorphins are kind of good. They make you feel good. It can stimulate oxytocin. When I hear Anita Baker, mm -hmm. I um, and get all <laughs> goo-goo-eyed and, and we shoot hearts at each other. It can help you feel more energetic. So yes, if you're working out and like my my uh, fitness instructor that played the Eurythmics, um, it, the song had a great beat and we were doing our, our triceps push-ups and it kept us going through a difficult class. Right. And so endorphin, remember, that's your endogenous, meaning from within morphine, our own natural morphine. Okay? Yes. Oxytocin, that is the monogamy, okay, a relationship you know, hormone, it's not just monogamy. And, you know, you can have an oxytocin be released just by seeing good friends and things like that. And then the mood part is both the dopamine and the serotonin gets elevated. And so they, those are those are both targeted by um, therapies, you know, where we're trying to help people with mood disorders. You're trying to elevate their dopamine and, and improve their serotonergic connections. And you can do this. This would be cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. We do it on your own. So if I hear um, Anita Baker... <laughs> I get a rush of dopamine, and so I'm feeling happy at that right, at that right, point. Right. So um, music is very effective in treating um, uh, issues like depression. It's effective in treating things like stroke. It's effective in treating things like Parkinson's. So people who have movement disorders may have difficulty. Um, people with Parkinson's may have difficulty initiating movement, and when you play music for them, it makes it easier for them. To, to move around right, a absolutely. little bit more it, normally. What it does is it recruits um, kind of these, their lost circuits that have, you know, we, there are circuits in, in Parkinson's disease that are there for doing certain motions. It's just, it's just getting to them to trigger and initiate. And uh, so music can kind of bypass the loss of dopamine that is, that is normally, you know, the physiological mechanism for recruiting that circuit. Yeah. And people who have speech problems, either as a result of stroke or because they have a stutter or something like that, um, sometimes singing works when they can't speak. So it's a workaround that your brain can can access different areas of the brain through music. Right, as opposed to, and that's because yeah. the right side of the brain is your rhythmic language side. OK, so so 
Um, the left side is just, these are the words, this is what they mean, this is how I say them. And then the right side gives you intonation and, and you know, the, the different types of, like I said, rhythmicity that you would normally have in music. So Yeah. And then it just generally is a great way of managing stress. Now, um, anyone who lives in L.A. spends some time in their car, on the freeway, maybe on the train, using mass transit, whatever. But you turn your radio on, you listen to music, and it helps that um, time that you spend in traffic go by a little bit, a little bit more easily. So um, music helps in a lot of different ways. Okay, let's go on to our, oops, it's doing that. Okay, so well, as part of our readings, we had an AARP article that was a summary of a report on the power of music. So we've also included a link to the full report, which is very long and technical in case you wanted more information. But this kind of gives it's, you... It's not that long, though, but, it, but, it, but it's, no. there. But, it's but, there. But half it's the there. article is... Um, our citations, references. So it's yeah. there for you to use as a resource if you ever want to do Absolutely. something more down the line. Absolutely. Now, what I wanted to draw your attention to, because you might, you know, be looking at this AARP article that's a summary, and and you might overlook the fact that there's two videos, short videos in the article, and they're both, I think, kind of cool short videos. Video number one is called How Music Can Keep Your Brain Healthy. And they said, you know, there's four things that you should you should um, do. Listen to new music. When you listen to new music, it makes your brain exercise and work a little harder. So you're listening to maybe a, a new song, um, maybe by someone you already like, or maybe a new type of music. So it's kind of good to branch out and listen to music that you haven't listened to before. Um, making music with other people, of course, during the pandemic, that's been a little bit difficult. But um, if you play an instrument or you sing, um, I sing to my dog. I don't know if that counts, but uh -huh. I sing her songs about what a good dog she is. And she responds very well. She she <laughs> she's on the floor next to me. <laughs> um, you can dance, sing, or do both together. That's obviously a great stress relief. Um, we are not the best dancers that you've ever seen. Kind of like um, Elaine from Seinfeld. <laughs> yes, we're You have to look that up if you haven't seen it. We are extremely awkward, and that's how we ended up together because we're perfect for each other. However, we can dance or sing around the house. I can still bob my head. You know, no one has to watch me be awkward. I can do it in the privacy of my own home, and it's it's all good. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're having a good day, we can dance around the house and sing to each other and sing in the shower. Um, put on a happy tune. I thought this was kind of funny because um, what, how you define what is a happy tune really depends on, you know, what kind of music you like. And some music is sad if you listen to the words, but the melody is happy. Um, when I was in college, I lived in Houston and they had a huge festival across the street from my university called the Juneteenth Festival. And they had the most amazing groups come, B.B. King, Lightning Hopkins, and just anybody that you can think of was there. And we would go and we would dance and and bring food and drink and you know have a great time listening to the blues. But if you listen to the words of the songs, you know, they're usually pretty sad. Nobody loves me. My life, you know, sucks, you know, but the music itself is very happy and very danceable. So find what you like. Find the music that makes you happy, um, whether it's jazz or blues or rock or heavy metal or gamelan or, you know, whatever, or pop. If it's Taylor Swift, then that's awesome. Um, just listen to what makes you happy. Now, the second video I thought was very um, moving to me because it highlights stroke survivors who are in a choir and um, activating their brains together, singing together. And, you know, some of the people who are singing are not the best singers in the world, but they're all really supportive with each other. So they've got sociality. They're feeling the social connection. They're with other people who've had strokes. So they all get each other and it's a really safe, happy place for them to be together. And so it shows them, you know, singing and performing and, and talking about how much it means to them to have this opportunity to sing and perform together. And a lot of them play musical instruments at the same time. What I thought was really cool about it is that Francis Collins, who is a legendary, legendary scientist and the, just recently stepped down as the director of the NIH, was talking about 
you know, here's a guy who is one of the most preeminent scientists in the world. And he was talking about how important music therapy is and how important research is into how does music therapy work? Why does it work? You know, how can we apply this to, um, to uh, helping patients? And he specifically talked about the investment the NIH has made recently in, in uh, research into music therapy. And he talked about the different pathways of talking versus singing and, and how, um, how great music therapy was for people who have speech issues. So, and, and many of the major medical centers around our country and around the world now have music therapy program, just like they have a hematology oncology or they have a gastroenterology you know, group. They have a music therapy groups. Yeah. So if you're um, planning to work in long-term care, if you're planning to work in senior living, um, being mindful of the power of music therapy and the power of music is really a good idea. Um, and I know a lot of, in a lot of situations in hospitals, they have found that if you have patients listen to music before they go into surgery, they do better. So we're seeing very powerful physical and mental effects from, from music therapy. Okay. So the other thing, just to summarize what the AARP report talks about, is it talks about music stimulating the brain. Um, you know, memory, movement, mood. So all these different um, parts of your brain get stimulated by music. It can help you sleep. You know, you find a type of music that's very soothing. When my kids were little, we used to, um, I used to go in and, and, and read them books and rock them. And we'd listen to James Taylor because he has such a, such a sweet voice. Um, it can help your memory, as we'll see with dementia patients. It can activate their brains. It can reduce your stress. Um, for people who are musicians, we've seen incredible benefits in children who, who study music in school. And both of our kids went all the way through um, uh, to college uh, playing musical instruments and being involved in music programs. So it does help um, your math skills. It helps your language skills. It, it just it just activates so many different um, areas of the brain. And for this class, again, stress and anxiety. So again, you know, I just, you know, it, whether it's you or your clients, just remember to throw on a little music when, uh, you know, a particularly challenging situation is coming up and it has huge benefits. So. Absolutely. Um, we also see music can equal social interaction. You might go to a concert with your friends. You might be playing music just, you know, in a, in a courtyard at USC and everybody starts singing the song together and you all bond in that moment. Um, when you go to a football game at USC and they, um, they play that one song where everybody does this, everybody, you know, thousands of people are doing this. Yay. Cause they love the song. We synchronize. We synchronize. And, and we all have that moment of oxytocin release because we're all in this together. Yep. Um, and so, so there are, there are just so many different ways that music can be used. We talked about stroke rehab with the video and, and the AARP article and, um, and Parkinson's therapy too. Okay, so this is the screenshot of what the underlying big giant report looks like. And what, one of the things they included in the report is recommendations. So they looked at, okay, what's the data? What do we know about the effects of music? It's good for people that are over 50. It's good for caregivers dealing with caregiver stress. It's good for people dealing with health issues. When I have to go as a cancer patient, when I have to go get a bone marrow biopsy, get a CT scan, get some kind of test done, um, Sometimes the first time I went to get a bone marrow biopsy, I was just absolutely, you know, nervous. And now I've had a couple, so it, you know, I'm like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> it's no big deal. The first time, I should have been listening to music. I was using a meditation app on my phone to try to calm down, but they, when they brought me back into the room right before they stick the giant needle, <laughs> and they took my blood pressure, and it was not good. So um, next time I have some sort of test like that, I'm going to listen to music. So um, the and other, yes. I was gonna, and I was going to say, you know, I, I, I was just showing my ADHD here, but I was just thinking about the music and how it's just, you know, part of all of our lives. Next time you go out to a dinner at a nice place, you know, they put it on there. We don't even think about it, but it's it's a very designed playlist that they have in restaurants that will improve the overall uh, dining experience. So, so 
think about that next time we go out there. Yeah, I used to work when, of course, in college, we all had our jobs that were not, you know, our favorite jobs, but I, I worked in restaurants a lot when I was in college and high school. And we'd have a four hour tape that would play music. And then if you had to work a double shift, you'd hear that music yeah. like five times, you know? And so, um, but that music was all supposed to make people happy and eat their food fast and leave because that was the type of restaurant I worked in. But also you to know, go away, you know, thinking, go God, I really sad. enjoyed that meal. And you're in a part of you didn't even realize was because of the music they were playing. Sometimes I'm in the grocery store and I'm kind of like, all of a sudden I realize, oh wait, they're playing a song I like yeah. in the background. That's right. That's right. So one of the things we have to be mindful of is um, having community support and having support in, in facilities for, for elderly people for music activities and music groups. So my um, stepdad and my aunt live in senior living communities in Florida. My aunt participates in several different choirs and that's a great activity for her. So they get to work and prepare a concert. So they usually have something around the winter holidays and then they have something you know, in the spring and they all come together and rehearse and rehearse. And it's, it's, it's a very social, very happy experience for her. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a cool thing. So we need to make sure that people have these activities and that we're supporting um, music in, in our communities and in our long-term care facilities and things like that. Okay, whoops. And this is just a little, um, a uh, segment of the music on our minds report that talks about the immune system and the, the power to, um, to boost your immune system, reduce inflammation, which we all want. Especially Remember, that's the opposite of what stress did. Remember, exactly. Remember stress and the sympathetic nervous system enhanced or increased inflammation. So exactly. Is... So we want our immune systems during the pandemic. We want them to be strong. And we know there's a, a new wave of Omicron. I got COVID in June after avoiding it for two years. On the airplane, so, of course. Yes. <laughs> we, were, we were actually coming back in two wonderful weeks in Costa Rica. And then sadly, it was on the airplane. So. But we should, uh, so we should all be listening to music right now to uh, make sure we don't get COVID. Absolutely. Anyway, okay. so all righty, keep going. Oops. There you go. Okay. So now there's this little animated video. It's a TEDx animation, which um, goes into detail about not just listening to music, but playing an instrument and how great it is if you have that talent or you have that ability. And you can pick up an instrument. This is something that we should encourage people who are reaching retirement age or getting older. That's something, hey, you know what? You've never played the guitar before. You've never played the flute before. You've never played the saxophone before. Why not start now? you know, and, and get into it. And so, so they talk about how when you do these functional MRIs, you can see the brain lighting up. And we've even seen videos where someone's having um, brain surgery and uh, the person is a musician, is a violin player or something like that. And they have the person playing the violin while they have their brain open and the surgeon is going in trying to, trying to remove a tumor, but not wanting to um, take out anything critical for that person who is an accomplished musician. And so they'll, they'll, they can track your brain as their. And then functional MRI in me is, is um, uh, different than just the, the photographic, just flat black and white image of the brain, but it tracks as it tracks blood flow. So whatever areas are most active, then the blood vessels open up to deliver the oxygen and the glucose. And so they're in, and it's a very complicated um, mechanism, uh, how, how they figure it out. But the bottom line, you're just looking at what areas are getting blood flow. Yeah. And so that, um, that, uh, photo I showed at the beginning with the brain right. that was lit up in different colors, right. that was that an was FMRI. An FMRI looking at so blood they're flow. very, very useful for, um, figuring out what happens in the brain, um, in reaction to certain stimuli. There's, there was even a recent study that was kind of fun where they took dogs and put them into the MRI machine. And then they tried to figure out if the dogs were more motivated by food or by their owner, by, um, you know, uh, I guess loyalty. <laughs> and so they would, they would show them food and then they would have the owner come and talk to them and they'd watch the dog's brain, brain light up. We have, so. we have a strong fMRI group at the, the Leonard Davis school. So we have uh, teal like, um, Andre Irumier and we have Mara Mather. All three of them have look at different aspects of behavior and brain recovery using and emotion and cognition. Uh -huh. Exactly. And so when we look at being a musician and playing an instrument, and I talked about this already, 
fine motor skills, obviously, as you as you're playing your your flute or your saxophone or your guitar, um, language skills, math skills, obviously creativity and executive function, planning and memory. Because as you're playing music and reading music, you're having to think ahead. Okay, this is what's going to happen next. Um, I need to play louder. I need to play softer. You're you're putting together some very complex information in order to improve your performance. And just the recruitment of each neuron responsible for movement, that's the executive that says, okay, you're going to do this one, this one, this one, this one, this one in a sequence. So. And so they found that music was even better than other um, types of art activities like painting or something like or sculpting or whatever and other sports and exercise because it did so profoundly light up the whole brain. And so I think that's something that's a little bit, um, we see it with, with a little bit with yoga, but, um, but we definitely see it with uh, music. Okay. So this is the second uh, video uh, in that um, article or in the, in, the, in the readings that just talks about the scientific basis of music theory. Um, music improves your mood. It affects your health. Um, uh, dopamine gets released when we listen to music that we like. So dopamine is reward center. So if you do cocaine, you get dopamine released. If you listen to music, you get dopamine released, but it's a lot better for you to listen to music, it's, right? It's directed and purposeful <laughs> with yes. music, whereas yes. with cocaine, it's everywhere yes. and about 10 times what it should be. Yeah. And so listening, when you think about pain and dealing with pain, when you are a patient and you're dealing with chronic illness or, um, you know, multiple medical procedures or in the hospital, think about how powerful it is to have those patients um, listen to music. And, and most dentists now, when you go to the dentist, they will have either a TV on the wall to distract you or, or my dentist has an iPad that he hands me with a million different um, music channels on it and headphones so that instead of listening to the dentist, you know, drill, I'm listening to music and, and hopefully that makes me a little more relaxed and happy. So this is a very, very cool video. It's just a, a little snippet of this documentary. So I think it's about five minutes long. And this guy, Henry, when they walk up to him um, in, the, in the video, he's um, got that classic posture of someone with really profound dementia and his head is down and he's not looking at anyone. He's not interacting. He's not talking. And they said, that's how he sits. He doesn't interact with anybody. He just sits in his chair with his head down on his chest, really kind of ignoring the world around him. And so non-responsive, he's non-responsive. So yeah. then one of the um, aides in that facility was very interested in music and, and what kind of music might motivate him. So she figured out what kind of music he liked. He was a big fan of Cab Calloway. So um, she got, she got a, um, a, a bunch of you know, Cab Calloway songs. And it shows you too how, how much time to change. It was before iPhones. Uh -huh provided the music, it was the iPod. That's right, yeah. so they had, a, they had an iPod <laughs> and, um, and they hooked him up with his headphones and instantly as he's listening to the music, he starts moving his hands and he starts kind of humming along to the music. And after he listens to the music for a few minutes, they, they take the headphones off and they say, you know, we're sorry, we're just gonna take your headphones off for just a few minutes. We wanna ask you some questions. And by asking him yes and no questions, he was very engaged and verbal. And do you like music? Oh yes, music is everything. Music is love. Music is, is the world. Music means everything. And then they ask him, you know, who's, who, what was your favorite song or what was your favorite musician? And he says, oh, you know, and he immediately breaks into the song. So he remembers the lyrics, he remembers the melody, he remembers the artist. And this is someone who was almost completely nonverbal and non-responsive. 10 minutes before. And so he's able to maintain this engagement for a few minutes um, after he stopped listening to music. I don't know how long it lasts. It's probably 15, 20 minutes yeah. max. It's not going to be forever. But it was so profound in terms of the effect on him and certainly um, brought him happiness. You know, and he just said that this music is love. Right. And this is and, you know, somebody um, that is very late stage Alzheimer's. And so, so then you have to, you know, peel, peel it back and say, okay, if we had just known more about this form of intervention and, and utilized it more in the early stage of Alzheimer's, would we then slow the progression? 
Absolutely. We, our neighbor that used to live next door to us um, taught exercise classes to people with Alzheimer's. And she said she would have, she would have patients who were very profoundly um, impaired by their dementia, but she would play the music and they had the muscle memory of the exercises and they were able to participate in these classes and do pretty well. So it is, um, I just think it's amazing. It's cool. I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, this is a, 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 a link to information about Gabby Giffords, who was um, shot in the head. So she had a traumatic brain injury and had... And it, it took out the expressive part of language, okay, in the left side right here in the frontal lobe. And so she knew what she wanted to say, but we actually have a, an array of neurons that then will assemble the words. And so she, she would want to say something, but the words wouldn't come out. But then she would do music and it would recruit the right side and the right side had the rhythm that we talked about and it would peel it out. So it was cool. Yeah, so really an incredible um, benefit to her. So she understood she had no problems with receptive language. Right. It was expressive language, being able to turn around and, and speak. And she's worked now for quite a few, quite, quite a few years yeah. with speech therapy, with singing, and um, music therapist, playing so. and playing the right. French horn, um, which is a you know pretty complicated instrument right. to play, and so she's been able to make enormous progress, and she's now able to give right. speeches when she finds some. Sometimes there are certain words or certain phrases that are very very difficult for her to say, and she'll sing them. She'll find a way to kind of the way she speaks has a little bit more melody right. than the average American maybe. Um, because the rhythm of saying the words in sequence is still there on the right side. It's the left side of the actual bring that word up that's gone. So that's called brocasuria and uh, brocasophagia or um, expressive. Yeah. Music, so. And so we have a link on uh, Blackboard to the American Music Therapy Association, which is a really kind of interesting place to go. Um, let's see. And I think that's the last that's slide. It. Awesome. So, Very all cool. Right. So that's, you know, the, the, the PowerPoint is, is powerful as a PowerPoint because it really does review everything that, that is in here. Um, we always like to use to have the links here so you can go directly to them. And, um, and there's the actual videos right there um, that Julia talked, talked about. Um, there's a quiz again, uh, and these same quiz questions show up on, on the final exam. And then, you know, just uh, you guys have been doing a great job adjusting the prompt and don't forget to, to uh, look at somebody else's primary uh, prom, uh, response to the prompt and make a comment and you do that three times. And uh, I think that's it, huh? Yep. All right, all right, very cool. Well, we'll see you next time for exercise. Right and uh, yeah, bite on.